Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I hope everybody's having an unbelievable uh, week to this point. Look, uh, I got some things I want to cover. Some things actually uh, one person requested I cover in light of some other stories I shared. Uh, so I'm going to try to get to that ASAP. Look, if you believe in what we're doing, show some love, show some support. Uh, we need all the support we can get at the Odyssey Project with all the programs and work we have going on in the community. And these stories just simply amplify where we are as a people and the work and the help we need uh, in many different areas that I specialize in. And I definitely want to give of myself as much as possible, but I do need your support. So if you believe in the work that we're doing, show some support. If you find the information valuable, if you find it in, uh, encouraging, if you find it uh, informational, click the like button, click the share button, and subscribe. Okay, with that being said, uh, earlier this week I shared two uh, unfortunately tragic stories with you. One about Marcus Lofton and Alicia Lofton, a husband in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that uh, shot and killed his wife after only six months of marriage um that was domestic violence uh that was charges filed he was ordered not to go near she filed for divorce he got served uh and he killed her um then there was the story i shared with you about matthew jamal kendricks and shateria watkins he killed her 10 days after their wedding um and there was some other story you know underlying facts about the story you know he had it wasn't his first act of violence long before they got married five months before they got married he had discharged a weapon uh during a disagreement with her uh and unfortunately she still married him and she ended up losing her life she was only 20 he was 24 uh someone brought up after viewing those uh stories and my uh analysis on what's going on in the black community and this violence and how it's playing out and obviously the focus in this point is on african-american uh male violence but someone uh cheryl i believe it was cheryl uh wanted me cheryl uh gray wanted me to uh address um recuna um, i hope i'm pronouncing on a recuna recuna williams uh, who is a WNBA basketball player, used to play for the Sparks, is now at the Aces, and she is currently not playing because of back reasons, probably going to be suspended, but she was suspended in 2019 for domestic violence against an ex-girlfriend, uh, who I believe is Alcaria Davis, uh, has her listed as a professional model. I don't know what type of model she is. I'm not going to get into that, but that was the ex I was asked to address this new charge of Rakuna uh, being charged with domestic violence against her current wife. And when I use the wife, I use it solely as a legal term. I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of that right now. I'm using it as a legal term. I'm also using it because I could not readily identify who this young lady is. So I don't have a name for her. Uh, and I mean, you know, obviously, if you really want to go and dig uh, if it's public record, it's out there, but that you know, for this story, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, we're just going to call her her wife. That's the legal des designation, and that's what we're going to do uh, for that. And there are some things that's going on. She's charged with a lot of things. And so one of the things that I want to first address here is we have a problem with violence. And one of the biggest concerns I have is this one concern that, that, that we're dealing with right now today. And that is we focus as we should on violence against black women when it's committed by a black man. Absolutely focus on it and we should. The one thing that black women should be able to depend on is being in a secure and safe environment when a black man is present. A black woman should not be in a state of fear and feeling threatened when a black man is present and that's on our that's on us that's why i have consistently pushed the idea of proper racial socialization i cannot share it enough this 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 channel is literally pervaded with information on uh the black man lead right of pastors initiative and how 
actually properly racially socializing young black males reduces their proclivity towards violence, but also adds some very positive effects as well. Uh, but we focus on that. We focus on that and we should because why? Because statistics tell us that the second leading cause is the, actually the second leading cause of death for females between the age, black females between the age of 15 and 44 is intimate partner homicide. So we have a problem and the vast majority of those partners are what? Black. So we have a problem there. But I think what goes completely under the radar and is hardly ever challenged in it, there's never any real true energy effort or, or, or the same level of anger and frustration is when a black woman is assaulted by another black woman. Whether it's intimate partner violence, domestic violence, or in another way, we tend to not view that as being as devastating, as dangerous, and uh, catastrophic and tragic. And the truth of the matter, it is. Now, what we what, what we should also pay attention to is that, and why we should pay attention to it is that we see that domestic violence within the gay community, same-sex relationships, is actually higher than heterosexual relationships. Um, the Northwestern uh, University Feinberg School of Medicine did a study. There are several other studies, but the most recent is by Northwestern uh, University's Feinberg Medicine, uh, School of Medicine. They did a study and found that um, same-sex marriages definitely have a higher rate of domestic violence than heterosexual marriages. But it didn't just stop there. It wanted to determine and discover why. So we look into it and there are a number of different things. First and foremost uh, is the added, you got, you got, when you, when you, uh, it's called uh, uh, the mi minority theory. And what it means is that when you are part of a minority, minority group, there are uh, things that come as stresses, discrimination, uh, what we call microaggressions and things of that nature. We as black people definitely can understand that we can experience that. But I am not going to in any way deny that it doesn't happen to other groups. And it definitely happens to people who are part of the LGBTQ community. So there are these microaggressions and all these things that also add. Anything that's a stressor adds to the agitation, emotional, emotional agitation and proclivity of uh, proclivity that creates an increased risk of violence it's one of the reasons why you properly socialize young black males why so that they have the, the more a person knows who they are the more a person is confident in who they are the more a person has a reason to believe that in operating in who they are they can produce the outcomes they desire in life the less chance they are to be disruptive to be violent to be come depressed and so many other things that can lead to negative outcomes so you have the external stresses, but probably the most prevalent influence are the internal stresses. The internal stresses are feelings of in, uh, being uh, inconsequential, of feelings of being uh, inferior, feelings of how uh, they are being perceived. And this is one of the things why I'm, I'm, I'm constantly on parents about this new hype about supporting and pushing kids in gender confusion. Gender confusion happens. This isn't anything new. It's not like all of a sudden the world just shifted and the world fell off its axis and all of a sudden kids start questioning who they were. Gender confusion isn't new. But here's what I can tell you through the study of this uh, going back for years. I, this is new in studying this. Uh, because it impacts the community. If it's impacted the community, I've at least put some serious hours into it. Whether I've mastered it and understood it is one thing, but I've definitely put some serious hours into it because this is what's necessary. And we need to have great minds come together and unify. There needs to be great minds in finance, great minds in sociology and psychology, great minds in business, great minds in politics. Uh, we need great minds in family development and all of this to come together and create a, an agenda that furthers our desire and our goal of saying empowerment. Saying empowerment and pumping your fist is symbolic. If the symbolism isn't followed by a very specific and highly clarified agenda with specific points and blueprints that drive that agenda, it, we're just talking. And the time is out for talking. Our, 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 our sons are killing our daughters, and now we are finding that our daughters are killing our daughters. And it, 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 it's our thing. But when, when I go back and I look and I study uh, gender confusion, and it's just simply saying, who am I? 
I was born like this, but why do I feel this way? And there are a bunch of different things that go on, and it can be as far as, you know, a number of different things. you got so many influences, and the more I study epigenetics, the more I understand the influences on uh, environmental influences on genes, thought influences on genes, perceptional influences on genes. Your genes are responding to your thoughts. Literally, your genes are responding to your thoughts. So your genes are also the one thing that expresses yourself and your identity, your behavior, your health, and everything else. So we have to be aware of this. But one thing I can tell you is that with all this gender confusion, that and it, like I said, it's always been there. What, I, what I've discovered is if you have a child who is struggling with gender identity and you leave them alone, you don't influence them one way or another. You don't, if you don't get that off, if you don't stop, if you leave them alone and let them find themselves, uh, what I've discovered is 84% of children who struggle with gender influence, I mean gender uh, confusion, and are not influenced in either way, end up choosing their natural assignment. It's just a process of searching and everybody goes through different variations of it along the way. But obviously, if you start pushing and influencing, you can really truly damage them either way. Because what a child needs to know more than anything is that you love them. A child does not need to think they need to make decisions for their lives based on what's going to make you happy. Because then they start to live a life for you and not for themselves. But at the same time, trying to let a ch trying to facilitate a child's confusion at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, even fourteen and fifteen, is putting them in a space that their minds can't perceive or calculate what comes with it. And what comes with it is uh, the things that you don't hear people in the gay community talk about: depression at a higher rate, domestic violence at a higher rate, feelings of inferiority, and and and. Um, feeling less than in in, in inadequacy uh and and, and 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 so many other things and these internal feelings are the very things that drive the frustration and the anger on the on the perpetuator side and also drive the feeling of i deserve this on the victim side that's why you you have and another reason why that why it happens at a higher rate it's rally reported because a lot of times these same-sex relationships one of the people in the relationship may not have come out and so now if i go report this now everybody's going to know and it's going to be officially out and it's going to be in a document and so what happens i sit back and i guarantee you there's a reason why this wife is so clouded and shrouded that nobody knows her name because you go and you look, you look. I, I wanted to, I wanted to find out who she was because I wanted to refer to her by name, out of, out of respect, you know, give a name to this person who has been victimized. And something else that I saw that is also important to me because I think when we think domestic violence, we automatically go to the obvious, the physical violence. And physical violence is very devastating, but also emotional, psychological violence is equally as devastating, especially over the long term. And I think that what we need to do is understand when we are actually in a domestic violence situation and when we are actually perpetuating, perpetuating violence and not classifying it as violence. One of the things that I saw was one of the charges was coercion that constitutes domestic violence. Okay, what is coercion that constitutes? It's actually called coercive violence or coercive control. And it's the use of mental mind games and intimidation tactics and uh, gaslighting and all these different things to manipulate and control a person to the point that they feel oppressed and shrank. And it's, it's literally recognized in some states as a form of violence. And you can literally be charged and it can be listed in the divorce decree as one of the reasons why and used as a means to determine the, 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 the distribution of the assets and any type of monetary settlement. So it is very, very important that we understand that violence comes in a number of different ways and we tend to only see it 
in its most overt form and that's in physical violence and we have to understand that because physical violence can lead to physical death but what happens when you experience psychological death emotional death spiritual death because of the mind games being played in the suppressive techniques that are being used by controlling people who have their own inferiority complexes so now you know when i talk about this this domestic violence within same-sex relationships it has absolutely nothing to do with my stand on homosexuality because I love all of my people and I have relatives that are a part of that community that I absolutely love and adore and I love my people period and I'll go to war and go to bat for any of them how I stand on something is my stance on it doesn't mean I don't love you you know I have a very strong stance on promiscuity doesn't mean I don't love you I just know what it'll do to you. I'm making my stance as the best I can based off of information. And I just don't believe we as a people can afford that. Especially when it comes to our men. We already have 1.5 million of our men missing. But that's that. But with that being said, set that aside. And the bottom line is we still have unhealthy behavior and we can't sit up and start dissecting and splitting our groups to determine who needs to be helped and who doesn't. When we look at this situation, to me, it's equally devastating. And it may be even more devastating. Why? Because nobody's going to take it serious. And we know this. Why? Nobody's in an uproar about it. You know, she's doing to her ex what Ray Rice did to his, what Kareem Hunt did to his, and you go down the list and there are these things where it was absolutely roar. And again, I am not going to advocate, I'm not going to cap for any cat that's putting his hands on a female. I'm not going to cap for a cat that's sitting up, manipulating, running, running mind games on a female. I, I am really truly an advocate of black men standing up and saying, I'm going to truly step into my role as a leader. I'm not just going to beat my chest and call myself a king, call myself the head. I'm going to be aware of how I handle our women. And don't get me wrong, again, I am not sitting up saying I got all the answers. I'm saying that there's a way that we need to have an intent on carrying ourselves. I'm not saying that every move that you make is going to always be the ideal situation. What I'm saying is your intentions will guide you. Sometimes there will be misunderstandings, misconceptions, uh, mishandlings, but your intent will be revealed through the movement of how you operate and the character and the, and the strength of your integrity will guide your intent and keep you in focus of what you're supposed to be doing. So when we look at this, we have this one side where it's easy to sit up and see where a man putting his hands on a woman is a bad thing. Number one is physically, there's a bigger disparity in strength. So there's an obvious disadvantage for the female. In, 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 in the other sense, the aggression is different. Normally, the aggressor is going to be the one that identifies more as being masculine and seeing themselves as the dominant within the relationship and is going to have a more aggressive approach. The other one, the, the victim will normally be more docile, less inclined to be violent and more inclined to want to submit or want to just see it stop. And then you create this situation. So for the, for the ones who are asking me to address it to me it's equal now obviously i hold a little bit more of a personal sentiment towards getting our men right because i'm a man and i know that we have the ability to protect but i'm telling you that in the sense and 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 while and, and let me be clear here when i say same-sex marriage and, and domestic violence it's not just women against women it's male against male too uh, and again, it gets confusing because neither one is going to be viewed seriously because when you talk about male on male violence, man, deal with it. It's, it, 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 it's not going to register. So that's happening in female on female. Again, Hey, two women fight. No, well, the bottom line is there, there's violence. There's a psychological, uh, impact. 
outside of the physical impact, there's a psychological impact, and it has some devastating consequences. So again, we need to be aware of this, and we need to provide assistance to the victims. We need to provide uh, resources to the perpetrators. We need to try to help as many as need here. Now, the thing is, when you look back with Rakuna Williams, she's had a problem for a long time. 2019, she breaks into her ex-girlfriend's house. Again, I think her name is Akela Davis. She breaks into her house, flashes a gun, threatens to kill her, uh, suspended for 10 games. Now, check this out. How long is Jai, uh, Morant, Jai Morant suspended for just brandishing a gun? He didn't point it at anybody. He didn't threaten anybody. He is suspended, what, 25 games, I think? Something like that. He was suspended eight games the first time, then 25 the second time, but just brandishing it. She's breaking in houses, beating up people, and pointing guns, and threatening their life with it, and she got a 10-game suspension. Again, it shows the difference in how we view the violence that a female uh inflicts upon someone and the violence that a male perceives is perceived to be you know in in Jai's case he didn't do anything he just think now granted i don't think it's something he should have did and i think that you've got to be responsible with how you move and you carry yourself i'm not advocating for the dude i'm just pointing out the difference in how it was handled i'm not advocating i'm not one of the people that's saying give him a pass he didn't i'm saying you gotta go, know, know, know how you gotta know where you're at it's not about doing what they want you to do it's about saying hey there's certain things i don't want to present and i don't want the people that my kids are looking at doing that kind of stuff because they're going to think that's what they're supposed to do now my kids are grown but i'm speaking in general now again it's my responsibility to set the standard for my kids but i've got to be realistic in that i am not with my kids all day and they now are in a world where they have devices that expose them to things that are they are going to be around more than i'm around them because they have that phone 24 7 and you can't get them out of it you got to literally take them and say hey not not right now man i used to laugh i used to drive these my kids crazy uh you know i i hit that darn go uh button and disable the uh, the uh, disable the internet in the house, and then disable their devices at a certain time of the night. I had all their devices hooked up to mine, and I'm disabling them a certain time of night when it's time to eat. We're disabling them until after we eat because it was controlling so much of their lives, and it was presenting to them in so many ways. No matter how many times the things you put blocks on, that they figure a way around it. So what I would do is sit them and say, "Well, at least during this time, this is what's going to happen." Uh, drive them crazy. They don't want that. They don't want the structure because there's so much on the outside that's pushing it. So then what was, what must we do? We've got to take the opportunities to sit up and say, you know what? We're going to create structure. We're going to create structure. Now, the thing is, there's some things that Rakuna Williams is going through. Uh, Rakuna, Rakuna, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm butchering her name and, and I'm not doing it on purpose. Uh, so, uh, my apologies for that. That's not what I'm doing. Uh, my concern is for her as, uh, as well because she's there. And that's one of the things that I talk about with the men. When we look at the men and they've done something hard, when we look at uh, Matthew Jamal Kendricks and him stabbing his wife nine times, we, he's a monster. He's a creep. He's evil. He's all these. And he is. He's terrible. But at one point in time, he was a little boy who needed to be covered, who needed to be taught, who needed to be properly socialized who needed the hugs of his father and his mother who needed to know that he was loved who needed to know that he had a place who needed to be taught some things and somewhere along the line we obviously dropped the ball okay marcus lofton same thing shoots his wife multiple times head and shoulders head neck and, and, and torso uh as she flees out of a window trying to get away from him uh because she discovered he was going both ways and that he had beaten her up and she wanted out of the marriage uh, and so uh, somewhere along the line, that person that we can easily identify as being dark and evil was failed as a little boy. And that's where we need to be dealing with this at, with the little boys. But let's go to Rakuna. Somewhere along the line, she's been failed. You got to think, 
there's no easy journey for someone who is identifying as a same sex uh, orient. So that's and that's the reason why I'm saying stop pushing these flimsies of thoughts and and, and flips within the mind of a child because they go up and down, they go in and out. And if you leave them alone, they normally find themselves. They do. But if you start saying, okay, let them be whatever you want to be, and you start pushing it on them. You're pushing things on them that they cannot project into the future and see what comes with it. You're talking about identifying one of the most highest depressing rates outside of black women in general are transgendered women. High level of suicide as well. But everybody's pushing it. Let them be. But what's coming with it? Let them get to an age where they have time enough to process all of the things that come along with what they say they feel and they want. Because what I'm telling you, a lot of them are realizing that, hey, man, you know, this is this. And they're coming out and they're being productive citizens in their own thing. My thing is, whatever you decide to be, I'm going to love you. But I don't necessarily have to agree with what I'm seeing. But I'm not going to sit down and condemn you and mistreat you and mishandle you because of your choice. I'm just not going to co-sign it. And, and that's my right. And that's how we got to learn to love each other. We got to learn to love each other without having to co-sign. I don't owe you to co-sign for you to prove to you that I love you. I love you when you come to me and you need me. I got you. That is what we need to be showing. But we also need to understand the pressures that come with this, the, the inability at certain levels to process this. And then you don't know what's going, what went on in our home. See, I've been talking about adverse childhood experiences, done the workshops and all these things. I've been sharing that stuff with you because it's so prevalent. Now, here's the thing. Not only are we talking about the adverse childhood experiences and the implications as we're talking about domestic violence. I'm talking about adverse childhood experiences and how it's affecting her mental state because her psychologist called the courts and doing this process because she's now out on conditional uh, bond. She's released on her own recognizance, but she's on a condition where she's literally got to report in, I think, every week to an office. She can't leave uh, uh, Las Vegas. Or she can't leave the state or she can't leave Las Vegas. It's one of them. She can't leave the general area. And she has to report every week. And this is going to be until the case is resolved. And she was initially released on her own recognizance, but they, they actually uh, came up with her past and looked at how things were going. And her psychiatrist called and said, look, shit, man, there were times I, I was worried about it because she was texting me with suicidal ideations. It was, I was afraid she was going to harm, harm herself. So there's a lot going on there that we are not dealing with. We're dealing with basically what we tend to do. We're dealing with the symptoms. We're dealing with the outplay of things, but we're not dealing with the in play and the onset and the causality. And because we're not dealing with those things, we don't have an understanding of how it's working or what to do with it. And so we get real frustrated because we see the end result and the outcome, and we don't have a lucid enough perspicacity or understanding of what created it to do anything about it. So we go through generation after generation reliving trauma instead of shifting and changing it and doing something about it. It's our responsibility to adapt new behaviors, our responsibility to create resources. It's our responsibility to sit up and say enough is enough. It's our responsibility to say that the death rate for black women to, uh, in romantic relationships doesn't have to be that high. The intimate partner violence uh, intimate partner homicide and intimate partner violence rate doesn't have to be as high in the black community as it is. It does not. And so that we're clear, the intimate partner violence rate goes both ways. Actually, women and men uh, assault each other within their domestic environments equally. The difference is when women do it, it's normally a slap, a push or whatever. When men do it, women normally end up hurt or dead. It's just the natural force and the aggression that comes with us. We go places that they can't physically go with us. And so there's a more devastating outcome. But the problem exists on both sides of the spectrum. And we need to be able to deal with that. And the th thing is, we can. I told you that proper racial socialization lowers the proclivity of violence. It simply does. It is a proven thing. I've done the research. I've written uh, the work. I've created the programs. I've implemented the programs at a scale that I can afford to amend, uh, implement them. It works. This is what happens. And it works for, for females, too, since we're talking about same-sex relationships and we're talking about Shakuna. But let me tell you, it works. Here's what happens when you racially socialize a young black male. Less likely to commit violence. 
less likely to drop out of school, which means they are less likely to become incarcerated and be criminal minded. They are more likely to develop skill sets that will allow them to earn a living wage, start a family and sustain the family, meaning they're more likely to stay in a family that they start. This is all verifiable, statistically verifiable. When you properly racially socialize a young boy, he young black male, he performs much higher than when not. It's like taking someone and throwing them out there and saying, you'll figure it out versus saying, hey, this is what you're going to do when you, this happens. This is what you're going to do when this happens. This is what you're going to do. This is who you are. Don't let ever let anybody tell you anything less. No matter what's going on, no matter what you face, all, all these different things are part of the socialization process, but it's grooming and growing. And it's also done by a while, uh, allowing them to watch real manhood being modeled in real time. Because see, nobody has a perfect life. Nobody's having this blessed life where everything in their life goes right. So when they get to be around you and watch you deal with adversity, watch you deal with the moments when you and the wife aren't getting along. Watch you deal with the moments when you're having financial difficulties. Watch you dealing with the moments when uh, you are having problems in, in, in your business or at your job and how you manage it and how you have a level of confidence in moving and how you trust, how you operate with other black men. All of these things are important. How you treat a woman, how you handle your daughters, how you handle your wife, the level, how you talk to your wife. Never raise my voice when I'm dealing with a black woman. No matter how she coming at me, I'm never going to raise my voice. I'm never going to use derogatory language when addressing her. I'm never going to talk down to, even when she's on a level down, I'm not going to talk down to that level. I'm going to talk up to where I expect her to be. Maybe she meets me there, maybe she doesn't, but I will not be a contributor to her delinquency or to her deterioration. I am going to be a positive force, if only for a second. But this has to be taught because, see, we live in a little culture where lifting a woman can easily qualify as being a simp. Think about how Russell, Russell Wilson has looked at. And think about the person who dogged her out and how he's championed. Think about it. This is a culture that celebrates the dude that knocked you up went knocked up a bunch of other people don't really have nothing to do with you until you find somebody that wants to have something to do with you despite that you've been that person that everybody looks at and he and he takes you in and says hey i take you as you are and i got you that child too and every child we create after that he's a simp and that's why we are where we at as a people because the man is now the simp and the player is now celebrate it the person who is literally breaking down the woman is celebrated the person who is literally diminishing and creating situations where little children aren't getting what they need in the home both parents now this isn't me beating up on men only ladies you've got to care enough about yourself but again that goes to what proper socialization see it's not just the males it's the females too we have to socialize them with to socialize them into the idea that they're exceptional that they're extraordinary that they're beautiful uh that they have a standard that they need to be living by that is the standard that they need to be demanding how they should be treated and see the thing is the reason that domestic violence continues as long as it does is because the victim doesn't believe they deserve better you don't believe you deserve better and accept less you can say i know my worth but I'm going to watch what you're willing to tolerate and tell you what you think of yourself. No one tolerates less than what they think they, could, they deserve. So what do we do? We elevate the standard of expectation within. We elevate the, the expectation and standard of how I'm going to carry myself, what I'm going to demand of myself, what I see in myself. We got to get rid, rid of what? The self-hatred. And when we get rid of the self-hatred, bam! Everything shifts. When we get rid of the self-hatred, we stop looking at them for validation. We stop asking them to accept us. We stop asking them for help. When we start realizing who we are and we fall back in love with ourselves, the game changes. And they know this. That's why they constantly pump stuff that promotes self-hatred, that promotes divisiveness, that turns us against one another. Because they need us to be broken. Because if we become anywhere close to whole, 
We've proven what we can do broken. We've proven how resilient we can be broken. Just imagine what we can do if we heal. So that's my challenge. It's time to heal. So my prayers go out to this wife, whoever her name, whatever her name is, uh, to every person that has been a victim of domestic violence. My prayers go out to you. My challenges go out to you. Uh, to those of you who have been the per per perpetrators of domestic violence, my prayers go out to you and my challenge goes out to you. It's time to change. You are an enemy of your people when you are harming your people. It's time to change. So with that being said, look, there are so many different ways we can do this, but I really and truly believe that if we create a national network that allows us to properly socialize our children, taking the programs that I already have, and I'm looking and I'm working right now with connecting with some people to be able to uh, do this on a national level, create a network of cities where we have the program in place so that we can start socializing. The way the program is set up now, it starts at age four. And then there's a rite of passage ceremony at age 13. But then there's all these things that happen between uh, 13 and 21. And then there's the follow up all the way up to age 30. We're dealing with this. We have to create strong black men. And we don't do that by coming along after they've torn up the world around them and saying, this is what you're supposed to be. We demanding it of you. No, you start building strong black men with little boys. You start building solid, sustained highly refined young black women with little girls we've got to heal and we start by taking kids who haven't been damaged and making sure they don't get damaged then we work our way up we can't keep reproducing the damage and ever fix the problem so again if you have been inspired encouraged informed click the like button click the share button subscribe and follow if you believe in the work that we're doing, if you believe in Black Men Lead, if you believe in our programs for uh, young women uh, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, incest, and domestic violence, if you believe in our mental health programs, look in the description, description box and click the link and give. We're still looking for sponsors for the women on our list that are sitting and waiting for services. And we have men too, but the men are covered for those who will give to Black Men Lead. The men are going to be covered in whatever they need under that but our women need services black women are the most likely to suffer from depression women suffer from depression more than men and black women top the group we need to provide services that help we need sponsorships and so much more but again my challenge is if you believe in what we're doing look in the description box click the link and give on that note I'm out of here. I want to thank you so much for allowing me to take up your time. I hope, Cheryl, I hope that I uh, adequately responded to your request to address this particular issue. And I gave it some sense of uh, awareness and understanding. I think it's important that we are aware that it is going on and that it does matter. On that note, I am out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.